thank you for joining us today. It's great to get together, even on, virtually like this, for worship. Just before we, I read some scripture for us and call us to worship, I just want to remind us that we're going to be serving communion at toward the end of the service, right as a part of the end of the message. So if you could have the elements ready, uh, then you'll be, <coughs> excuse me, you'll be prepared for that. But in calling us to worship, I read from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Let us gather together to worship him. I invite you to sing from wherever you are as we worship the Lord together. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come, invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives For you're our joy and prize To see the captive's hearts released The hurt, the sick, the poor at peace We lay down our lives for heaven's cause We are your church We pray revive this earth Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. We pray Unleash your kingdom's power Reaching the near and far No force of hell can stop Your beauty changing hearts You made us for much more than this Awake the kingdom seed in us Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty and land set your church on fire win this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here oh build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand Heal our streets and land Set your church on fire Win this nation back Change the atmosphere Build your kingdom here We pray Our God saves Our God saves Morning 
mountains to songs of praise. Our God saves. Our God saves. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves. There is hope in your name. To songs of praise, our God saves, our God saves, our God saves, oh our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name, morning. To songs of praise, our God saves, our God saves. From the mountain to the valley, hear our praises rise to you from the heavens to the nations hear our singing fill the air May homes be filled with the singing. May our streets be filled with joy. And may injustice bow to Jesus as the people turn to pray. From the mountain to the valley, hear our praises rise to you. And from the heavens to the nations, hear our singing fill the shine in the darkness as we walk before the cross and may your glory fill the whole earth as the water or the seas from the mountain
tune your heart with mine in prayer. Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to bring praise to your name. And will you hear our, this, this, uh, our voices today, Father, in song, in prayer, in reading, in preaching? Would you, would you hear them and receive them as a gift to you, as, as worship to you? May you be honored through this. Lord, as we walk through this or maybe sit through this pandemic and wonder where we're headed to, we know that for our local governments in the province here anyway, and probably local governments and municipalities, that they're going to be making decisions in the next day or two. And Father, we ask that you would give them wisdom, let them know the best decisions to make for uh, protection, but also, Father, for uh, our, the good of our health as well. Uh, not just our physical health, but our mental health. And Father, help us as the body of Christ, those who trust in you through Jesus Christ, to help others, that we might be the love of Christ to them. Whether it's an encouraging word or whether it's a practical deed that we can do, help us to be able to do that. And we continue to look to you, Father, saying, what do you have for us in this? What can you show us? What can you teach us during this time? And have us learn that, Father, and follow through with it and live that that you have for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, just in case you turned in a, tuned in a little late, we're going to be observing communion at the end of my message. So if you could have the elements of the, the, the bread or a wafer and, and some juice uh, ready for that at the end of the message, that would be appreciated. Once upon a time, and when I say once upon a time, it's a story. And I've got a couple of them today, so just remember that. It's not fact, it's a story. But once upon a time, there was a husband and wife who lived a very busy life. And what they found is that they were, as they were getting older, they were starting to forget things. And they thought maybe something was wrong with them. So they went to see the doctor, and the doctor said, you know, usually when you lead a busy and active life and you get a little older, you tend to forget things. So what I would encourage you to do is write, when you think of something, write it on a small post-it note or a small notepad or something like that, then you'll be able to remember it. Well, that evening, as the couple was watching TV, the husband uh, went to head toward the kitchen, and the wife asked him, would you get me some ice cream while you go? He says, yeah, I'll do that for you. She says, well, you might want to write it down so you don't forget. And he, he kind of rolled his eyes at her a little bit, like, I'm sure I'll remember ice cream when I go, and don't worry about it So when I get there. Well, then she said, well, actually, I'd like some chocolate sauce and some whipped cream on it, too. So with all that, maybe you better write it down. And he was just ready to blow up at her and he thought no I just tell her to do it herself but he did the sweet husbandly thing and he went to the kitchen for her and to get what she wanted about 20 minutes later he came back to his wife and he gave her a plate of bacon and eggs and she looked at it just exasperated like wondering what in the world is he up to and she was just ready to blow up and she couldn't contain herself any longer and she goes I knew you would do that you forgot that my toast Do you ever have those moments of forgetfulness? I think we all do from time to time. Somehow I think God knew that we would be forgetful people and he established ways in which we could remember things that were important, that he felt were important for us to remember. Sometimes God can use unusual ways to uh, re remind us to remember uh, th those things. Uh, for Job, it was a life of tragedy. For King David, it was a life of a fu fugitive. For King Solomon, it was a life of uh, realizing that the life of material possessions was no good. And in our text this morning, we're going to see uh, where God chose to remind Joshua and the people of Israel to remember what he had done through 12 stones, uh, 12 simple stones he was using as a memorial, something that, he could, something that they could remember him by. So I would encourage you to take a Bible and open it to uh, Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 to 24 is what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at the, the, na the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. They're finally crossing over the river into the promised land, the land that had been promised to their father, Abraham. And as they're crossing into the promised land, God's going to have them set up 12 stones as a memorial to remind them of what he had done for them. So follow along as then, I, then as I read from Joshua chapter 4, starting at the first verse. <clears throat> when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from the right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. 
So Joshua called together the twelve men and he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God, our God, into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone and on his shoulder, according to the number of twelve tribes of Israel, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your ch children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These sort of stones are, are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried, him over, carried them over with them to their camp. They, they put them down there. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot of where the 12 priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. They are there to this day. Now the priests who carried the Ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything that the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua. The people hurried over, and soon all of them were, had crossed. The Ark of, and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. Then, then men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over, ready for battle, in front of the Israelites, as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed and for battle, about 40,000 armed for battle crossed over the, before the Lord on, on the plains of Jericho for war. That day, the Lord exalted jo Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they st stood in awe of, of all the days of his life, j just as they had stood in awe of Moses. Then Moses said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the covenant law to, to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went for up from the Jordan to the camp at, and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that had taken, they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants and ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For, your, for, for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had all crossed. He did this so that the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that the, you might always f fear the Lord your God. This is the word of God. Before we get into the text a little, little, in a little more depth, I want to just uh, make a point of clarification here. The text opens and says here that in verse 1, that it, with the declaration that uh, Israel, the Israelites had finished crossing the Jordan. But as we uh, go through the text, we, we see where they, didn't, they hadn't actually crossed over the Jordan but we're getting ready to cross over the Jordan and did throughout the, the text cross through the Jordan. I highlight that for us just because you might say, well, what order is it? And really what we're thinking of here, we're not thinking of the order of how things happened. We're not thinking about how things happened, but we're thinking about what happened. What's occurred in this context here? God realizes that we can be people who forget and, and we can forget what he has done. Uh, we are no different than the Israelites in, in the Israelites of the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 12, it says there that Moses had issued a warning to, the, to, the Israel, to, to Israel. He says, Be careful you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So there were already a warning to the, to the Israelites back then. And how much more of a warning should we have today? That we can tend to be forgetful people. We can tend to forget and walk away from God. We can tend to forget what God has done for us. So what I want us to do this morning is to consider uh, the, this uh, God's ordering of the memorial that we see in Joshua 4. And remember that it's not only us who's prone to, to forget, 
So not only Israel is prone to forget, but us as well. And look at this of how God uses memorials in our life too. So as we consider this, let's first note that the God's provision for more memorials. How does God provide us with memorials? By what means does God give us memorials? And one of the first things that I see in the context of, of these verses this, t- today is that God gives us memorials by speaking to, directly to us. In verses 1 to 3, we see here where God is speaking directly to Joshua and telling him, this is what you need to do. This is what has to happen for these, this memorial to be set up. Again, once upon a time, so I've got a story for us. Once upon a time, uh, President Bush, after President uh, George Bush the Younger, after he had uh, finished being the president, he was uh, taking a life of leisure and he was doing some fishing. And one day while he was fishing, he accidentally fell out of the boat and drowned. And he appeared all of a sudden at the pearly gates. And as he's at the pearly gates, Peter greets him and uh, President Bush uh, says, you know, there's been a mistake. I shouldn't be here right now. And he convinced Peter to look into it. So Peter, Peter went and looked into the situation to see what, was, what the problem was. And uh, sure enough, President Bush shouldn't have been there. So Peter went back to President Bush and he says, well, I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is you shouldn't be here. The bad news is I can't do anything about it. He says, so here's how I'm going to try and make it up to you a bit. For your first week up in heaven, rather than assigning you the regular duties you're going to have, you can just do anything you want. And President Bush thought about it and he thought, well, I was fishing, so I might as well just keep on fishing. And so he was assigned to a lake that he could go and fish in and he cast his fishing rod in and he reeled in the biggest fish of his life that he'd ever caught. And he did it again and he reeled in the fish. Five or six casts in a row and he's reeling in bigger and bigger fish each time. Well, then another person came and sat beside him and started to fish and it was Moses. And as Moses is fishing, he's not having any luck. And President Bush kind of notices this, and he he looks over at him, and he starts to give him some advice. But he noticed, President Bush notices that Moses starts to ignore him. And finally, President Bush, in exasperation, he says, listen, do you know who I am? I'm the former president, George W. Bush. And do you know the things that I've done? And and you, you should listen to what I have to say. And Moses says, you know what? I really don't care who you are, and I don't care what you have to tell me. And quite frankly, as far as listening to what you say, the last time I listened to a bush, I ended up wandering in the desert for 40 years. You know, God may speak to people directly, but most often, not, most often he doesn't. There's an economy of miracles in the Bible, but don't always expect God to, God to answer in a, in, a, in a supernatural way for you. Don't always expect that to happen when we have it. But God can still speak to us. Some might say that God only spoke in the Old Testament times. But if that's so, why do we find in the New Testament verses like Luke chapter 11, verse 28, that tells us, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. So we hear the word of God and we obey it. Or John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. That we as his sheep are to listen to Jesus. So we're still to be listening to to the Father. Maybe the one reason we don't think God speaks to us directly is because we don't listen to him. We don't take the time to listen to him, what he has to say to us. Uh, we're born of the Spirit. God's Spirit speaks to our spirit, and we need to stop and listen to him through our spirit. But God also provides miracles to us by working through others. We see this in verses 4, four to 5, that God used to, uh, Joshua to speak to the people of Israel, the tribes of Israel, and speak to them and to provide them with this memorial that they had. The testimony of others can help to spur us on. Uh, I often will read biographies of people, uh, uh, believers in God, and hearing their testimony, hearing about their faith in God can help spur me on. We can use that to spur us on. Uh, We can leave a a legacy of our testimony for others to spur them on. It can be used in a sense as a memorial, a life story of someone as a memorial to someone else of hearing that. And the third way that God provides uh, memorials to us, and these aren't the only three ways, but it is th- they are three ways that I find within the context of our text today. And we see it in verses 4, 8, 10, and 20. 4, 8, 10, and 20. All through this chapter, we see obedience. God provides memorials to us through obedience. When we are obedient to what he asks us to do, he can provide us with 
with uh, a memorial. Joshua was obedient. The 12 uh, men were obedient. The people of Israel, for once in their life, uh, are obedient for this period of time anyway. The priests were obedient. If we're going to receive anything from the word of God, we need to be people who are obedient. Well, there are many different ways that God can provide us with and give us memorials, but it remains to be seen, what purpose do memorials serve? Why does God give us memorials uh, for that? And that's what I want us to consider uh, in the final part of the message this morning. Why does God give us memorials? There can be many reasons, but I'm just going to highlight these, these uh, couple of reasons that we find within the context of our verses today. He, can give, he gives us memorials to remind us, to remind us. Verses 6 to 7 and verses 21 to 23. The last part of verse 27, uh, sorry, verse 7 states that the stones are to be a memorial for the people of Israel forever. That they're to remember what I did for that. The meaning of the Hebrew word memorial means to remember. Uh, given, given, given the people's propensity to f forget, it's little wonder that the memorials played an important role in the Bible and the, the life of the, Israel in particular. And I would suggest even today, memorials can play a role in our life. And I'm going to comment on that more in a minute. Have you ever uh, had occasion where you've gone from one room to the next room and forgot why you went there? Probably, I'm mean, probably the only one that ever, ever happened to you. Well, actually, we've probably all had it happen to us. We go from one room to the other room. I recently saw a meme on Facebook that ha had a bit of a cartoon on it where the person had said, I'm so proud of myself. I went into a room the other day and I remembered what I went there for. Granted, it was the bathroom, but I remembered. When we forget what we want, what we went into a room for, what do we often do? We go back to where we came from. We go back to where we came from. And often we're reminded then, oh, that's why I was going to the other room to do that. And memorials serve that purpose. They take us back to where we had been. They help us to remember. Memorials take us back to where we came from. They help remind us of what has happened in the past. They, having, memorial, having a memorial is not living in the past, but it's remembering the past. We're not to live in the past. Ecclesiastes 7.10 tells us, don't long for the good old days. This is not why. So we're not to long for those days, but we're to remember those days and use them to spur us on to the future as well. Memorials in the, in the Bible were a way of, for future generations to participate in the acts of God of the previous generations. In our text this morning, when it says, as you, as when your, your children ask you, what are those stones there for? You say, this is what God has done. This is how God has provided. The words of verses 6 and 7 can form a word picture to us of the young child with their, with their parent, asking the parent that and the parent responding. And we need to use memorials as well, in, uh, as the, the memorials that God gives us as reminders of what he has done. We need to use memorials as reminders so that we can uh, encourage and help our sons and our daughters in their faith, in their faith toward God. Uh, a number of years ago, I had a, uh, we were friends with a missionary who every day she would write out her prayer requests. She would write them in a prayer diary, a prayer journal, something like that. And then she would record back in there when God had responded to them. And she never knew why she did that. She just felt as younger in life that she should start doing that. And she just kept it up throughout her life. She never knew why she did that. Well, when her uh, oldest son was in college, he began to question his faith. He began to question the reality of God. And one evening he was talking to his mother about the situation and uh, his mother was all of a sudden prompted to pull out the prayer journal, the prayer diary, and went through that and say, these are the things I prayed for and see how God answered them, see how God answered them. And he, that evening he, committed, he recommitted his life to Christ. See, just a simple book with some notes jotted in it was a reminder of here's what God has done. And it was used to encourage someone as they move forward. God uses memorials to help us Help, help remind us, but he also uses, uses them to testify about himself. He uses, his, uses them to testify about ourselves. This is what God has done, but this is about God himself. In verse 24, he says, so that all the people would know. So that all the people would know. Mar memorials are a way to help others know about God. A number of years ago, I ended up with this as a memorial in my own life. 
it's a shift lever off a car. Uh, well, it was a, actually a van we had. Uh, went on the steering column, just shifted it. And that turned out to be a memorial. Something that simple turned out to be a memorial from us. What had happened is we were living in Regina, Saskatchewan, and it was a, a day where it was much colder than even today where we are here in Brantford. It was a day that I think, if I remember correctly, it was about minus 48 degrees Celsius. There was a wind chill blowing, and it was about minus 70-something degrees Celsius. Now, an intelligent person would say, stay home. But Lorene and I were in Bible college and seminary, and uh, I, I can't remember if it was Lorene or me, had a paper due, and we felt we really needed to go. So I started the van, and I warmed it up. We had two children, uh, our son and our, our daughter. Our son, I think our son was about three years old, and our daughter about one years old. And I started the van up and warmed it up. And when we went to go about 15 minutes, 20 minutes later, I went to put the car in gear, and the shifter broke. I couldn't drive. Well, we made the, the, the rash decision to say we were two and a half blocks from the school. We'll, we'll, we will uh, make, make a, a go for it. And we bundled, our kids were bundled up really warm. Uh, but as we went, we started walking. My son kept pulling his scarf down off his face. And we were just at the last corner right before the school. And I could see that frostbite was starting to form on his face. And my heart was wrenched. Like, here, what am I putting my kid through? And just as I went to step off the curb to go across the street toward the school, a tow truck came around the corner and almost hit me. And I gave him a piece of my mind that I could all afford. And then Lorene and her grace, uh, she, she let me know that, just, just mind your temper. And so we got inside the school, and Sean's cheeks were pretty white from the frostbite. And all of a sudden, I lost it. I broke down. Tears started to stream down my face. I thought, why am I doing this? Just one, not even a year before, I had been... Uh, uh, working for Bell Canada, Lorene had been working in the dental field, and I said, why am I doing this? How can I do this? And, and a professor let me uh, sit in his office and gain composure, and I was thinking, sitting there thinking, why don't you just pack it in? Why are you going through all of this? But I composed myself and pulled myself back together and realized I've got to go home and see what I can do about my vehicle. So I went home. I was able to take this out. There's just one simple pen to take it out. It just took, took me two minutes to take it out. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And I was able to jam a screwdriver in there. And when the van warmed up enough, I got it into gear and I could drive to the dealership. And the dealer had one of these in stock. Like, what's the chance of a dealer having one of those in stock? We could say that's just uh, circumstantial. I would say it was a provision of the Lord that he had one of these in stock. Uh, and what had happened is a little ball at the end of this that had just snapped off. It was white metal. It snapped off. And so I was able to fix the, the, the car in probably 10 minutes uh, total of repair time. Now fast forward a year, I'm fixing my, we've got a car as well, and the battery's dead, and it's the middle of winter again, and I'm moaning and groaning that I've got to fix it and replace the battery, and I don't have time for this, I, this is not fair, this is, they're doing the typical feel of having a, a very uh, nice pity party for myself, but I'm trying to replace the battery in the car. And when I was working on the car, I went to my toolbox, I had a mechanics tool chest, to get some tools, and I saw this that I had put it there a year before. I just put it there and forgot to throw it in the garbage and saw it there. And when I saw this, it was like the Lord spoke to me. I was with you then, I'm with you now. I was with you then, I was with you now. See, it was used as a, a memorial when I hadn't even planned for it. Fast forward 20 years. I'm now living in New York State, Niagara Falls, New York. And it's a Sunday morning in the, in the winter. Everything seems to happen in the winter, I guess. Uh, the, the, our plow, plowing contractor, he, he was plowing the lot, and he had to come in and see me for something uh, earlier in the morning. And so he came into my office, and while we were talking, he saw that lever sitting on my, on my shelf. I began to set it on my shelf to remind me that God provides for us. So uh, he's uh, talking to me. He sees the shifter, and he says, what have you got that there for? Like, it seems a strange thing to put in the pastor's office. Well, I was able to share with him how God had made provision for me. So it was used as a testimony. It was not only used to encourage me, it was used as a testimony to him to do that. As you can see from that, lift, from that shift, shift lever, memorials don't have to be anything special. I have a broken shift lever. Uh, my missionary friend had some, some books with some writing in it. The people of Israel had some 12 stones. There's many things that can be used as a shift lever. But I offer this one caution of having a memorial in our life. Don't turn it into an idol or an icon to do that. It's not a good luck charm. It's to remind us of God. Not to say, as long as I got this with me, I'm going to be okay. 
No, we use it as to remind us of that God is with us and what God has done. As I said earlier, the word memorial means to remember. Uh, it comes from the word that means to prick or to pierce or to prod something. And so a memorial is to, 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 to prod us and remind us of what God has done. All through the Bible, God uses memorials. Early for the Israelites, he gave them the, the, the law set out in the, in the stone tablets, the Ten Commandments. He used the jar of manna that was in the ark. As they carried that ark across the river, that ark, that container, had inside it some of the manna that they had while they were wandering in the desert. The Lord also told the people of the Old Testament to observe certain days and celebrations as reminders of what he had done. Uh, they were to observe the feasts and the celebrations of God's provision, of God's deliverance for them. From the New Testament, we have a, the memorial of baptism. It can remind us of what God has done. From the early church, we have the memorials of the empty cross. is a memorial to us. Remind us that it's an empty cross, that Christ is living, Christ is risen. And he's not on that cross anymore. What memorials might God be giving you? Use them to remind you of his provision and his presence in your life. And so as we finish today, I want to close with one more memorial that God has given us. And we're going to participate in that memorial, the memorial of, of communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26, we read, For I received the words of Jesus, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took, took bread, and when he had give, given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we take communion in remembrance of him. In the same way, after supper, he took the, the, the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in, of, in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I suspect we're not likely to forget who Jesus is. We don't need a reminder to, to we're not going to forget Jesus. But what we probably need a reminder of is what Jesus has done for us. The magnitude of what he has done for us. Someone has once said, my sin is great, but my Savior is greater. My sin is great, but my Savior is greater. And let us, let us remember that through this communion meal, as we participate in this communion meal, a memorial that God has given to us. Many times the, the table in front of the church will say, do this in remembrance or in remembrance of me or something to that effect. It depends what church you're in. It's a reminder, it's a memorial of what God has done for us and what Christ has done for us. He's given himself to pay for our sin, our separation from him so that we can join together in God. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Father, as we come to this memorial, the memorial of communion, the memorial that has been given to us through Christ Jesus, I would pray, Father, a prayer of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for all that is meant, the depth that it is meant. Uh, sometimes I, I think we can glibly say that, uh, yeah, you pay for my sins and I, I get into being in a relationship with you, we get the eternity out of it. But it's nothing to be done and said glibly. Father, it is something that we take seriously, that we take to the depths of our heart. So thank you for these reminders all the time. And as we partake of the bread, as we partake of the cup, let us celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So in the words of Jesus, once again, if you could take your way for her bread. And in the words of Jesus, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take together. And then with the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. Father, thank you for this memorial. 
this memorial that is uh, perpetuating for all time until Christ shall come again. Help us to live this memorial of Christ died for us, gave his body, gave his blood for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to sing once more as we respond to this time. Let's sing. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. The King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder And leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love that you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory Who rules the nations with truth and justice Just like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace this is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy Worthy all, this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Hold your hands out and receive this as a gift from the Word of God. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Amen. Go in his peace.